Hello everyone. Thank you so much for having me here at this wonderful meeting. I am so excited to be speaking to you at the 2023 Melbourne meeting taking place in beautiful Australia. I wish I could be there with you personally, but this video lecture will have to do. Today we're going to talk about something really, really important, and that is your quality of life. How is it that I can give you some fresh perspective, some new ways of thinking about how it is you walk alongside all of the challenges that OT presents to you. I hope that you are truly having a delightful time learning from each other, sharing knowledge, developing and deepening friendships. That is one of the most important things with an isolating brain health challenge is to be amongst your people, your tribe, your community. So for those of you who have made it all the way to Australia, congratulations, but perhaps that was a little bit too far and you're at home watching me. I wanna make sure you feel welcomed as well. My name is Dr. Karen Sullivan. I am a board certified neuropsychologist and my interest in the world is to serve the unmet needs of all brain health communities. And I try to do that through my I Care For Your Brain program. My sincere hope today is that our special time together will leave you feeling validated in deep and meaningful ways. I hope you gain a fresh perspective that gives you a little bit more mental space to access your personal power and to live more flexibly alongside your OT with you in the driver's seat, not the other way around. I'm gonna introduce you today to the very best tool that I know of, acceptance and commitment therapy, also called ACT. It is an evidence-based practice that is designed to develop psychological flexibility in facing the demands of life. I find it to be a deeply wise approach that will help you accept the challenges, the many challenges that only you all know that OT presents in your life. ACT works in three different primary ways. The first one is in noticing and accepting our emotions. The noticing part turns out to be much harder than you might think. And in this case, we're gonna to focus today on a specific flavor of anxiety that happens in social situations. Number two is not attaching ourselves to these unhelpful thoughts, feelings, and most damaging behaviors that come along with anxiety, and how to hopefully better unhook ourselves from these thoughts. And third and most important, importantly, how to mindfully choose action based on what is most important to you. So that is my plan for today, and I'm just so glad to be here with you. Thanks so much for having me, and I certainly appreciate Colleen uh, asking me. I, I was overjoyed to say yes. So let's just start off with a classic definition of what any medical student would find in their medical book, if at all, in terms of a definition of orthostatic tremor. A rare tremor disorder characterized by a singular symptom of a high frequency tremor of the legs and trunk that appears when standing. Okay, very simplistic, one symptom, monosymptomatic, no complexity to it whatsoever, nothing else. We have a little bit more of an expanded version if somebody were to read any of the very few research articles that are out there on OT, and they might find some additional descriptors, like it also includes a strong feeling of instability while standing, fear of falling, fatigue, and often pain. But my question is, does that come anywhere close to capturing your experiences with this unique brain health challenge. Some of you have helped me understand OT better, even though I have a pretty rich description of it in terms of what's available to me as a doctor. I understand now that it is not just an issue with standing, that for many people, especially over time, it is also a challenge in terms of walking, mobility, ambulation, getting up and down stairs. But even still, I would imagine that these descriptions leave you feeling somewhat invalidated. And that just is a consequence 
of it not being complete and accurate. So some of you know from my webinar on OT that it's very important to me that you understand all of the non-motor aspects that come along with OT. And this is primarily a job of getting to understand the part of your brain that we're pretty sure is involved, which is the cerebellum. And we do a pretty good job of this actually, very good job with your two sister disorders, which I would say are Parkinson's disease. It is very well established that anxiety and cognitive issues and sensory issues are a part of having Parkinson's and patients are actually told that directly, not all the time. We're slowly starting to see more of a general knowledge base increase on essential tremor. But the truth of the matter is, is that we are nowhere near in the medical community of arriving at a whole person understanding of what you all live with. And because of that truth, that many doctors remain totally uninformed, never mind just, you know, not completely informed about the cognitive, sensory, emotional, and social symptoms that are related to OT. I think the truth is, is that it is really up to you at this point to validate your symptoms, map them out, name them, and soak up all of the high quality scientific information that you possibly can and try to get wisdom from the good quality resources that are out there on how it is you can live better alongside all of these challenges. And today you're in the perfect position to do that, not just at this meeting, but also making time for this experience of self-care. And that's how I'd really like you to think about our next 45 or 50 minutes. So I want us to start out from a place of empowerment and empowerment to me with OT means some very simple things okay the first one is feeling that you have a right to understand this brain health condition in detail that is part of your bill of rights as a person living with this and that goes so far beyond trouble standing it goes so far beyond even trouble walking the next one is that your non-motor symptoms the so-called invisible disability that you live with really must be validated and treated okay those are your basic rights and the third one is the right to live a life of the highest quality despite the impact of your symptoms and that's really the focus of my talk today so as a neuropsychologist to me the most important question that i ask a new patient is what is their quality of life and this sounds like a very simple straightforward question but it's actually not and the reason is because we often don't even get asked the question and so it's a little bit difficult to create some reflection on the topic but quality of life is a multi-dimensional concept that puts you the person you your spirit your selfhood your soul whatever we want to call it your uniqueness as a human being at the center of everything and everything else is secondary to that, including your OT. You are the most important, your quality of life, which to me means your emotional well being, your ability to connect to a sense of peace within yourself, to feel connected, and that you belong and participate in the things that are most important to you, despite the very real and significant barriers that OT presents to you. So the question really today is how can you maintain a life of deep personal meaning despite all of the realities that you deal with all day long? And I'd like you to just take a few moments to think about that for yourself. What really is my quality of life? A lot of different factors go into that. Well, quality of life issues in OT are almost virtually non-explored, non-acknowledged in the scientific literature, maybe a couple case reports here and there. And even your friends and family, even your doctors, even when we try and want and love to try to understand, the truth is we really don't get how difficult things have become or how restricted you feel. 
So in my talking with your community I, and reading the literature, I think that it really boils down to five things. And this goes with my philosophy of defining the map, right? What are all the parts? Because when we know the parts, we can maneuver a little bit within the landscape to set goals and understand how we can get from point A to point B. So in my understanding with these five challenges, uh, we've got these, these five primary causes. So one is the physiological nature of OT, your tremor disorder, as we say. It is true and real that your ability to stand, your ability to walk is caused by a cerebellar brain injury of yet undetermined specific cause that causes very clear and measurable symptoms that other people can see. They can see the hem sign, they can hear the helicopter sign, uh, they can see that you buckle and struggle to stand for long periods of time, but there's also many things that are just as real, just as physiological, just as hardwired that they can't see. And some of that fatigue, rapid recall issues, the word finding issues you can all struggle with, the emotional changes. So we've got a, a very hardwired neurological reason that your quality of life is threatened. And we're gonna to return to the cerebellum in a little bit more detail later. The other truth I think we have to establish is the othering that is created by what other people can observe about your OT. So it is true and real that some people are going to react to your symptoms by ignoring you, by objectifying you, by judging you, by questioning your reality. I think that that is an unfortunate part of humanity, what people don't understand they don't have empathy for, and sometimes people aren't all that motivated to understand. So that's where picking your people comes in uh, as a very important part of life. But the truth is you are othered because you have OT. The third one is the very real and true stress of living with a chronic and particularly a progressive health condition. So there are persistent fears and worry about what's next, what does my future hold, the unpredictability of symptoms from day to day, the concerns about future disability and dependency on others. This is a very real part of living with OT. The fourth one is the anxiety that we attach to these first three. Okay, and I know that's, I'm already talking in a way that's like, huh, okay. So the anxiety that's a part of it is also a physiological characteristic of OT, in my opinion, and also a reaction, okay? And that's the little piece we're gonna try to pry open today and really get into that because this is where our choice and our power comes in. The anxiety causes one of the worst symptoms of all, which has a very benign name, but is actually extremely detrimental, which is avoidance, okay? So in avoidance, we lose a lot, including ourselves, our connection to the world, our connection to our values. And through the loss of engagement that happens with avoidance. We stop doing the things we love because of reduced or lost ability or capacity. We then experience a disconnection from not only ourselves and our community, but ourselves and our values, ourselves and the bridges to the most cherished parts of ourselves, what matters most, our life experiences that remind us of who we are, totally separate from OT at the core of our being. So let's just return to the cerebellum for a few minutes. So the first direct evidence that we have that the cerebellum is the heart of what goes wrong in OT only came eight years ago. This is in 2016, and this was from what we call the Galea study. And this suggested a very specific focus for OT in the brain 
in the cerebellum, more so uh, in the lateral posterior lobule. How's that for some jargon? And really that's about all we know right now, but that is enough information that we can start doing a better job of validating and understanding why you might be struggling with the anxiety that comes along with OT so much. So I want to give you a little primer on the cerebellum because I truly believe knowledge is power, especially with this specific brain health challenge. So cerebellum is Latin for little brain. It's probably had the biggest glow up in the last 20 years in the brain communities, meaning it went from being kind of this overlooked little smaller brain, uh, kind of subservient to the cortex, the gray matter that you think of when you think of the brain, just being responsible for balance to all of a sudden, wow, people now actually think it might be the most influential part of the brain. So it's located uh, in the back of your, right underneath your cortex, right above your brain stem, kind of tucked right under there. And the way I want you to think about it is that it does so many things, extremely complex, and we only know about this much so far, but really we call it the great conductor. So even though it only accounts for about 10% of the mass of the brain, it actually contains as many neurons as all the rest of the brain put together. It works extremely fast, the absolute quickest part of the brain, and that's because there's so much white matter there, kind of the uh, insulation of the brain, so things can transmit very, very quickly. And it is kind of like a dial on the brain, so it can either enhance experiences, turn them way up, or it is like our neurological breaks. It can dampen down experiences. So this is part of why light sensitivity, noise sensitivity is so common in cerebellar issues because we don't have those internal breaks working very well to be able to give us that very quick, where it's not even a conscious experience of being able to almost symbolically put your hands over your ears to quiet a noise or, or wince and close your eyes a little bit so you don't see it. If you can kind of think of that metaphorically, that's kind of what the cerebellum helps us to do. So think about it like an adjuster where sensory experiences, life coming at us is either amplified or turned down. So I just think of it with the cerebellar issue, like the raw experience of living is really raw. Like there's no ability to put headphones on or earplugs. It's just a lot of intensity coming at people. So historically, cerebellum, like I said before, voluntary movement, balance, equilibrium, maybe muscle tone. It's only in the last decade or so that we even consider that the cerebellum has non-motor functions. And so when someone has a tremor disorder or ataxia or dystonia, people know it's the cerebellum, but usually the knowledge and the insight stops there. And what we really need to do is incorporate the non-motor symptoms, which are cognitive, sensory, and emotional. And what we're gonna focus on today is how the cerebellum coordinates specifically what we call the anxiety response. So the brain is incredibly interconnected and the cerebellum is no different. There are direct cortical loops, connections, to all sorts of parts in the brain from the cerebellum. So for the purposes of our talk today, we are gonna think how intimately they are connected to the limbic system, which is the emotional center of the brain, particularly the amygdala, which is our fear center, and the prefrontal cortex, which helps us make determinations about what is scary and, and threatening. And when we have disruptions in these loops, we can have indirect damage. So we can have a frontal lobe issue even when our frontal lobe is perfectly healthy because the loop is offline. There's one element of the loop that's that's the cerebellum that's not connected as well or as efficiently, so the whole circuit gets a little bit disrupted. So when we think about the anxiety pathway, we also know that the cerebellum is intimately connected with what we call the HPA axis. So this is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal 
axis. And this really is what connects the nervous system to the endocrine system, which helps to adjust how much stress hormone in our parasympathetic nervous system, how do we rest and reset after a stressor? So this pathway is critical for the physiological experience of anxiety. So things like heart rate, breathing rate, which I think is I've heard so many folks with OT talk about regulating their breathing being a challenge and stress hormone regulation. So to have a cerebellar brain health challenge, you are very likely to have a dysregulated anxiety response. So what this means is you are hardwired to pull towards anxiety. This is very important to know because what I find is without this knowledge, so many people internalize a sense of shame or inadequacy, like they're not handling things well, they're falling apart. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, it's, it's really a part of the, the neurological issues that you're struggling with. There's also a behavioral issue in OT that just reinforces anxiety continuously, and that is hypervigilance. So you are all hypervigilant. I can tell you that for a fact. And what this simply means is that you are in any new environment scanning the environment to see where you can sit down, how you can hold on, how are you going to escape or avoid that sensation of an impending fall in a hypervigilant state is an anxious state. And when we are anxious, It's very simple to the brain. It's zeros and ones. It's black, it's white. It's I'm gonna stay and suffer or get me the hell out of here. So the brain, you've got two things in OT that are pushing you to be anxious and to wanna escape the current situation. So we have to talk about this so we know what we're fighting against, okay? And what's key about hypervigilance is it also fills up your bandwidth. So one thing that happens with cerebellar issues is that when you are, there's something else taxing your system. So when you are fatigued, when you are in pain, when you are anxious, you are much more likely to become more symptomatic. So very simply put, your tremor is going to get worse when you're anxious. Your tremor is going to get worse when you are extremely overwhelmed by information. And being hypervigilant, the definition of it is is really being extremely overwhelmed with a, a dreadful feeling that you're trying to escape from. So what we, we also know, the reason I bring this up, is to increase your motivation to want to take a good hard look at anxiety and figure out how can we live with this a little bit more flexibly instead of becoming a slave to it, which really happens to so many of us for so many different reasons. So you also have to remember that you are not just your OT, right? That's a, a message I try to get out there a lot. You have plenty of other reasons you might be anxious too. You could have had, you know, a genetic predisposition. You know, our personalities are a little bit hardwired. Your socialization as a child might not have been optimal. You maybe have experiences with being, you know, publicly humiliated or overprotective parents or history of being bullied, right? There's a lot of things besides just your OT, but Even if everything else was perfect and you just had OT, I think it's really important that we validate that anxiety specifically in social settings, unfamiliar settings is is really a, a natural part of the disease. And I know when I talk to my patients with Parkinson's, because they have internalized this as normal, they don't struggle with it as much. And so that's why I decided to to make it my focus today. So if you go to the scientific literature, there's very little, if nothing, written about the prevalence rates or breaking down anxiety and OT to anything more specific. We have a couple case reports. Again, in Parkinson's, which gets so much attention in the movement world, that's very clear uh, how people, whole person, um, uh, assessment and, and treatment should go, but we, and we're starting that with ET, but again, we really don't have anything for your community. So that's why we're here trying to figure this out together. So I think that the, the, the type of anxiety that most maps on to what you all live with is social anxiety. 
but there's a, a, a basic premise of social anxiety that is violated by OT, and that is really the classic diagnostic criteria, which states that everyday social interactions cause irrational anxiety, irrational fear, irrational self-consciousness and embarrassment, and that this may include an excess of fear in situations in which one may be judged, worried about embarrassment or humiliation, or concern about offending someone. But remember what I told you at the beginning of our time together today, this is not irrational at all. I think the truth is that it's sometimes the truth. But what we have to reckon with is how do you continue to live a life that you are thrilled by, connected with, nourished in, despite all of those things being true. So social anxiety captures it a little bit, but it also doesn't. It is is not irrational, your fears. You are interpreting very real experiences or intuiting what I had called earlier othering. So this really gets into this idea of having an invisible disability. And that is a huge part of your lived experience with OT. People don't see so much that's happening underneath. So when we think about social anxiety, though, the pieces that I do think fit are when you break it down into its three components. So the first one is anxious anticipation. So what (laughs) what are all the what ifs when you start to think about, okay, I got an invitation. It's where your mind goes before you've even gotten to the place, right? The next one is in the moment, those fears, the humiliation, the embarrassment, the anxiety that happens in the then and now. And then there's the escape and the avoidance behaviors. So we sometimes figure that all out within a split second of getting the invitation and we just shut down going and say no before we even really think it through and stay home and then are disconnected. Or once we get to a place, we can also um, basically, you know, lose our ability to stay and not only want to escape to somewhere safe to lean or stand, but also actually leave that we become too overwhelmed. So in OT, your brain is literally screaming at you to don't fall, right? Find somewhere to sit, find a wall to go against. There is a extremely strong pull. And this is something you have to recognize as an enemy. This is something that is trying so hard to hook you. And this is where we're going to try to open up a little bit of space. We cannot let the anxiety be in the driver's seat. Part of what we're going to talk about today with acceptance and commitment therapy is a very simple metaphor of you need to be in the driver's seat and OT can be a passenger. OT can be loud and unruly and demand that you do all sorts of things, but your job in getting through the road of your life, your mission to get to your destination of a good and full life is you will have to learn how to manage this unruly passenger. And all of this takes self-reflection and tools. So this really gets us to a very important part of the lecture today, and that is thinking about avoidance and what you are avoiding. And most deeply what matters to me is what is the price that you are paying for your avoidance? So how is your withdrawal from the world impacting how you feel about the world, how you feel about other people, and most importantly, how are you feeling about yourself? So the challenge to your thinking that I'm posing to you today is maybe before the OT and the avoidance felt like one clump, and both of those things together, it was hard to distinguish them to be separate entities, but both of them were oppressing you, were reducing your quality of life, were reducing your abilities. And what I want to try to do today is start the process of thinking about it a little bit different and actually trying to tease those two things apart, that there is the OT and then there is the avoidance. And what is most important to me is that You don't think in any way that I am minimizing your experience. I 
And I realize this is easier said than done. Today is like a little seed that I want to plant. This is a, a journey. Today, I want to introduce you to some of the basic concepts. So if it appeals to you, you can explore this deeper and apply it more into your life. Okay. So there's some truths about anxiety that we all have to understand. So when left unaddressed and unchallenged, anxiety will get worse over time. There's no doubt about it. Your world will become smaller and smaller and smaller. And partially that's because we lose skills when we are avoiding, right? When we give into anxiety and we don't challenge it, it's more comfortable in some ways to not do the things that make us anxious. But again, what is the price that we're paying? So while we're avoiding, we're actually becoming less and less able to ever do it in the end because we are out of practice and the anxiety gets bigger and bigger and our sense of confidence gets smaller and smaller. And the longer this goes on, the more we overestimate the level of danger that's present, the more we overestimate people's negative reaction to us. And this creates a very vicious cycle, which results in more and more isolation. And like I said before, increasing isolation is not just alienation from your community, you and other people. It is really alienation from yourself right? You lose the relationship with yourself because we stop being who we are in the world. We stop engaging in the activities that make us us. We stop being a part of what defines us. A churchgoer, a music lover, a volunteer, a grandmother. And this can then really easily set up a situation where depression creeps in. And when depression and anxiety come together, it is very hard to maintain a sense of self-worth and self-esteem, which then further magnifies the experience of anxiety. And this is the map of a quality of life killer is when we have all of these components together. So we have to know what it is exactly we are up against. So I started to really think about this concept of avoidance and social anxiety, and I wanted to take it directly to you all, or y'all, as they say in the South where I live in the United States. Uh, I wanted to ask y'all what you thought about this. And so I went to the amazing Primary OT Facebook page and asked folks, and the, I checked this morning, it was like 90 comments, which is incredible, such a gift to me to be able to understand you better. And my question was, how does OT create a barrier for you socially? You know, what, what, what are you not doing because there is this feeling of embarrassment? And so I just wanted to share with you some of the quotes that I got because they are so helpful and I, I really think they're universal. I think a lot of you will see a little bit of your own experience in these quotes, and I think it will help validate you and, and solidify your sense of community and being understood. So here was one. It has definitely stopped me from volunteering for things where standing is required, such as being a greeter or working in a concession stand. The tremors are always at the forefront of my mind, okay? After sitting alone at a work party where everyone mingled, I no longer feel comfortable attending events like that and not being able to stand long enough to have a conversation is isolating. Okay, so again, I, I don't think you're imagining these things. I think that they are more likely than not true. All the situations in the US where the Star Spangled Banner is played or the Pledge of Allegiance is being recited, when you sit during these times it is an implied sense of disrespect but to stand for me is torture i have stopped attending church services because i cannot tolerate the standing and i am too embarrassed to stay seated when everyone else is standing church is so important to me so this has caused me considerable guilt sadness and emptiness so these quotes help me be able to start separating the impact of the OT and then the suffering that comes along from not doing the things 
that are meaningful and important to you. And this is part of why I chose to introduce you to acceptance and commitment therapy today, because it does a great job at slowing down and teasing these things apart and gaining a better awareness of the subtle distinction between all of these factors. These are just a couple more quotes I wanted to share with you. It's so embarrassing when someone wants to stand and talk and you have to walk away or try to explain, sometimes just sitting on the floor or the ground. So many difficult or embarrassing situations, it's easier for me to just stay home. But there is always unease in wondering what will be needed, how difficult will access be, how exhausting will I be, and much of the time it's easier to stay home. So again, to those, I ask the question, what is the price that you're paying for staying home. And again, I don't mean that in any way lightly. I, I don't mean that uh, in a shallow sense. I think it is a deep, poignant question for you to reflect on all that goes along with not participating. I hate using a wheelchair, makes me feel like a bit of a fraud. OT has definitely curtailed my social involvement. Um, some people had already clearly been developing some social, some psychological social flexibility around this, which is, you know, it's important to me if I have to ask for what I need. I, I learned to be more comfortable doing that. I've learned to be more comfortable carrying a cane or a portable chair or a scooter or be in my wheelchair. It is a, a psychological journey to accept symbols of disability in our cultures. And that is a huge piece that the medical community does not help you with. Nobody has those conversations with you when you're diagnosed with OT about what that journey and what that progression is going to be. So again, I think ACT offers us uh, some psychological support for these blind spots. So when I read all these 90 posts, some of the themes that felt relevant to me for this talk today were in the avoidance realm were the anxiety and fears that go along with being judged as rude for not participating in things that customarily require you to stand literally being talked down to symbolically being ignored being uh, objectified being too exhausted for the social piece because getting through the physical piece is so taxing. And then this dislike of needing to rely on others, not wanting to do things differently because you know it's a certain amount of acceptance about what is changing. And that is a psychological challenge that can be difficult. So because all of this is unseen, I do hope that many of you research invisible disabilities. There's a great website called invisibledisabilities.org, the Invisible Disabilities Association. There's a great book called But You Look Good by Wayne and Cheryl Connell. And they really go through the literature on that we can experience a reduction in anxiety through a few different skills that we can build. Disclosure, finding the words that feel right to us to communicate to other people, both briefly and in more depth, depending on the relationship of what we have, why we have it, what we need. Social support with other people who are going through a similar experience. That's part of what you're doing today or on the Facebook group. A fierce determination to take control when you can and validating your own experiences. Okay, so that part of our time together today, I, I want to kind of set the stage of the problem. And now we're going to start to transition into the like, okay, you're right. I, I, I see how social anxiety is affecting me. I see that it alone comes along with its own disability and avoidance. And yes, I also have very real things that limit some parts of my life from OT. But what we're going to try to do is focus on what would need to happen for us to have an engaging, rich, personally meaningful, intentional, and fulfilling life, no matter how you define it. So this is the pathway of ACT, or acceptance and commitment therapy. So the premise of ACT is to, is your job, it is an act of self-compassion and self-love to truly understand what matters to you and to continually move in that direction by using skills that unhook us 
from all of the difficult thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of anxiety that tend to get in the way of us living our values. So to be human is really to live your values. Values are not goals. They are not um, something to just simply pay lip service to. This is really the way we make a life that we are overjoyed about and and connected to. So despite the challenges, ACT provides us with a way to flex and to pivot so we can be the most authentic version of ourself in the world. Not bad, right? That's what I want. So to begin the ACT journey, the first thing that we think about is that we must deeply accept that the following is true. And the following is, I have a choice. I have a choice. I have a choice. This is true on so many levels, the biggest picture of our life all the way down to the smallest picture. This is a very important step in being able to gain what we call psychological flexibility, probably the greatest coping skill that humans can develop. And this is hard when you have a health diagnosis, a brain health challenge in which you had absolutely no choice in. You can start to have a relationship with the concept of choice that is negative. You can really feel helpless and there's a part of it that is true but I'm asking you to take control over the part of your life where that is not true. And even if it's a little sliver, it can be expanded upon. So the second step, once once you accept responsibility for the fact that you have a choice and you can exert a choice, right? You are not helpless, you are not passive, you have a choice. The second thing in ACT is that we identify what matters most to us. So what is our deepest, most passionate value? So what do I stand for? Well, how do I, what are my, my deep beliefs about the way the world should be? In 10 to 20 years from now, how do I want someone to remember me? How do I want people that I love to talk about me? If people had to say two lines about me in my obituary about the kind of person that I tried to be in the world, what are those words? What are those terms? Many values pertain to three categories, caring, connecting, and contributing. So in ACT, one of the first ways we start off in treatment is to do something called the personal values card sort. And we can't do that because of the way we're interacting right here, but I can certainly read you some values. And what I want you to do, I'm going to read a really long list. And what I want you to do is light up and write down, I've asked them to give you all a piece of paper and pen for this talk today. I want you to try to write down, you know, five to seven that light you up when I say them, that just make you instantly feel like, yes, I love that. That is me. That is what I'm interested in. That is what I'm passionate about. Okay. And then we're going to take it from there. All right. So I'm going to go through a long list now. And as I'm reading, you can even close your eyes and just start to really listen to what resonates with you. And then I want you to make your short list. So when I think of what matters most to me, It includes adventure, creativity, achievement, gratitude, music, romance, spirituality, peacefulness, purpose, passion, humor, independence, justice, knowledge, leadership, fun, generosity, compassion, comfort, health, fitness, service, growth, and honesty. Now I want you to look over your list and I want you to circle 
the top three. Okay, go through all of those and I want you to have a quick think about which three are the most important for you. Hey, one of the things that I really value is art <laughs> and handmade beautiful objects that human beings create. And so I structure my life in a way to make sure that I am aware of that value and mindfully pivot towards it whenever I can. So once you understand these values, I want you to think of them like your compass, okay? These are kind of like your North Stars. These are going to ground you, they are going to motivate you, they are going to inspire you at what we call an act choice points. Now choice points occur in every single moment. <laughs> we are either making a choice that move us towards the kind of person we want to be in our values or away from the kind of person we want to be in our values. And this actually happens in less than a millisecond, this choice point. It is almost always unconscious until you learn about it, but you can slow down between stimulus and response. This is where the choice comes in, okay? This is the epicenter of control of our lives, of creating and sustaining a life that we love. When we are hooked on anxiety, caught up in anxiety, we don't separate stimulus from response. We feel as if we immediately feel anxious. We immediately feel fearful or worried about something. But what ACT offers us is a way to slow down to realize we have a choice, and then to engage in what we either call away moves or towards moves, okay? And now away moves are actions that move us away from our values and decrease our quality of life. You might imagine towards moves do the opposite, okay? So when we are moving more towards our values, we are not hooked or we are less hooked by our anxiety. Now remember with OT, like many tremor issues, being hooked, which means having anxiety, also makes your tremor worse, which also makes your cognitive bandwidth shorten, which then also makes your tremor worse. So we could actually look at this as an intervention, not just for anxiety, but also for tremor. So inevitably, even the best, most skilled act believers will occasionally get stuck. Challenging situations and emotional roadblocks do occur. Some things are very, very triggering and it happens within a millisecond that we attach an anxious thought or a feeling to a stimulus, to a reality. This can stop us in our tracks and we immediately deny, we immediately try to get away, we immediately push back or shut down. And instead of being unconscious of that, you're gonna try to slow down and recognize that this is moving you away from your values, which is decreasing your ability to have that rich, fulfilling life that you deserve, okay? So how do we start to do this, right? This all sounds great, okay, so what are the, what are the skills? So the skills are based in self-reflection and compassion and involve the following. Being present, dropping our anchor, opening up, diffusion, doing what matters, and savoring the victory. So these are some of the skills that we build when we practice ACT. So the first one is to be present Oh my goodness. So when we want to be present, what we really have to do is stop or put the brakes on. Now, what did I teach you earlier? This is going to be harder for you than it is for me, because as of today, I don't have a cerebellar brain injury. But if I did, someone telling me to stop being anxious is going to be a lot harder for me. And I have to validate that and I have to know that and I have to be extra kind to myself because of that doesn't mean I don't have any free will or control it just means it's more of a challenge so what we're going to do is use the acronym stop 
okay? And we're going to notice that we're struggling, right? We're hooked, literally, I think of it now, I literally imagine a fish hook coming out of my mouth. We're gonna stop. T means we're gonna take a breath. We are going to observe ourselves, explore how we're feeling with kindness, and then proceed. So all you have to do in the first step is just simply notice. Just be in the present. Don't be in the future where you're worried about something. Don't be in the past where you're thinking about what happened in a similar situation. Okay, this is how I feel right now, okay? And once you are curious about how you feel, then you move to the next. So the first one really is like, I am an experiment. I am going to be very, I'm gonna use detective skills to increase my quality of life, right? So I'm gonna become curious. Instead of being reactive and getting swept up, getting hooked, I am going to be curious. So once we have the moment of I'm gonna be curious, then we drop the anchor. This involves three steps, there's all these steps. The first one is just noticing and naming what is going on. So anger, worry, beating myself up, fearing humiliation, the next thing we want to do is ground ourselves. So we do this by trying to reconnect with our body. Anxiety, when we all think about it, is it is very physical in many ways, but boy, do we drop out of mindfulness. We are so into future scenarios. Uh, it's, it's incredible. So we've got to drop back into the body and we can do this by shaking our hands. We can you know, if we're seated, we can move our feet up and down, we can stretch, we can focus on our breath, we can straighten our spine, we can push our feet into the ground, and we need to refocus our attention on whatever it is we need to do next, right? So dropping the anchor is acknowledging thoughts and feelings, getting into your body and just refocusing your attention, really just focusing on being at the here and now. The next one is the opening up. And this is kind of a soft emotional stance. This is a slowing down and an acknowledging that we need to allow for the thoughts and feelings. We need to create space for them. We, through the lens of self-compassion, have to be able to notice and not attach. Okay, again, this sounds like the easiest thing as I'm saying it, but it's not. It's a discipline very similar to meditation where you have to work at it. So an example of this might be, I'm noticing that I'm getting all whooped up and I'm already thinking I'm gonna decline the invitation. So I, I take a minute and say, okay, anxious thought. This is difficult for me right now because I'm really struggling because part of my OT is that I'm gonna have a lot of anxiety because there is a risk for me and I, I don't wanna fall and I, I don't wanna be hurt. This is part of me being a human being with my condition. We try to, again, now we're caught up in the thought. We wanna drop the anchor and get back down into ourselves and in the present moment. So we wanna try to visualize those thoughts as clouds that are passing us by and really just trying to put it outside of ourself. Like, oh gosh, there goes that anxious thought again. And this breaks the cycle of reactivity because when we're fused with our anxiety, we are a slave to it. We just do what it tells us. We just say no because if we feel bad and we don't wanna feel bad. This is the invitation of ACT, is how is it that we can recognize that we are not the anxiety, we don't need to respond to the anxiety. It is there to be respected, it is there to be acknowledged, but we don't necessarily have to have a response to it. The response to it is where the choice comes in. Okay, so the next step is the diffusion. Now this is where we actually start to separate, like I was saying earlier. Diffusion skills teach us that no matter how strong the pull is to do something about our anxiety, change it, not go, uh, avoid it, we can in fact simply acknowledge it and move on <laughs> and not believe it, not believe the lie that anxiety is telling us. We don't have to buy into it. Uh, we don't have to identify with it. We're simply, again, think about the metaphor of clouds going by in a sky. 
Acts suggest that when we diffuse from our anxious behaviors, that we get some energy back because anxiety is a real energy sucker. It takes a lot of effort to engage with our anxiety. And this actually frees up resources internally to be able to think more mindfully, more intentionally about what is really important, gets us back to our values, the the compass, how we want to show up in our lives when we are consciously living, not just being a slave to anxiety. So not only does this give you the chance of maybe having a greater quality of life, but I think the truth is it also is going to help with the severity of your OT. So like I said before, kind of a win-win. So diffusion really helps as well by shifting our focus from what other people might be thinking and gets us into showing up for ourselves in the moment, which is the other form of separation that we have to remember is when we avoid social gatherings because we are afraid of how others are going to perceive us. A, it's human. We can approach that with self-compassion. We are social creatures and belonging is hardwired in us. But we also have to tease it apart and, and not give them all of the power and control because those fears are going to grow and grow and then we become more limited and our world becomes smaller. So the next step is this is where we connect back to our values. The next step in this process is doing what matters. This is why you should take your three values that you circled and put them on your fridge. This is your your core instructions in life, your primary directions on how to build a quality of life for Karen, right? These are the three things that Karen must do in order to feel like herself and that she is engaging in the world in a way that makes her happy. So once you know what's important to you, then you have direction. Once you unhook from the anxiety, the question will becomes, well, if I'm not a slave to the anxiety and I'm not going avoiding or going away, what am I going towards? And it is those values. How can we live the values in everyday life? So this is going to require psychological flexibility. So this is the ability to bend, not break, to changes in our circumstances and be flexible in the way that we respond to the problems and the tasks that we are faced with in trying to build a life of quality. So this may mean finding words to disclose your diagnosis to people. This may mean accepting a mobility aid that's going to make you feel more comfortable. This may mean uh, recognizing how much anxiety has taken control of your life. Every one of you is so unique and special that I would never pretend that these hard and fast rules are going to perfectly apply to all of you. Like I said, my intention today was I just want to plant a seed for you and give you access to a fresh perspective that I really believe if you take back some of your core energy and put it into these self-discovery approaches that you will come out better on the other side. So remember, Rome was not built in a day. You do not have to set super lofty goals or take huge action. Doing the right next best thing, which is a towards move to your values, if we feel like we have to do too much too soon and, you know, I got to go to that buffet at my church, you know, we can end up feeling a lot of pressure. Uh, we can feel like we failed and we give up. It's really important that we do baby steps. Easy does it little by little. Consistent small actions over time really produce big effects, specifically when it comes to regaining your confidence, building back your sense of self-esteem or your identity. Breaking anxiety cycles is really, really hard, but you are worth every single effort, okay? You need to be in the driver's seat, not OT. And a very, very important step, the purpose of doing all of these is savoring the moment when you earn it, treasuring that feeling, no matter how small it is, of the victory, of the reward. This is the positive reinforcement that the brain and ourselves live for. To go through the suffering and come out on the other side with no gift doesn't really make us want to do it again. So the more gratitude, the more kindness, the more compassion that you can show yourself when you 
push back the bully of anxiety, the greater you're going to feel about your power in the world. And I think that that's really, really, really important. So remember, your life is like a mosaic, okay? There are many pieces that make up the entire fabric, the entire tapestry of your life. Having OT is but one piece. There are many, many other pieces, and that is not to diminish the presence of how OT challenges you because you know better than I do that it does. But this talk today, this special time together, was to remind you that you are more than this condition. You are more than this brain. Okay, this was a crash course in ACT. If you like it, there is a lot of free, high quality information out there. I thank you so much for your attention today. I think so highly of all of you as a community. You have taught me so much. I am so appreciative. I am a much better neuropsychologist today for having known all of you wonderful people. And I hope you have a truly, truly special meeting with time, connecting and learning and healing. Thank you so much. Bye.